Welcome to Pentecostal Preaching Channel. Please subscribe to the channel if you enjoy what you see. Hit the bell to be notified when something new is uploaded. Have a great day. The Bible says to come boldly before the throne of grace. Now the scripture says, command ye me the work of my hands. What a great privilege it is that we can come boldly before the throne of grace. Feel the presence of God. I've been to Aerosmith concert and a Ted Nugent concert and an Anthony Robbins, who knows what you call it, concert. And there is nothing like the presence of God. There is nothing that lifts your spirit more than the presence of God. It is so good to be here. What a blessing to be with you, Brother Shoemake, with you and your family. Thank you for your hospitality, for the insight that you have given me. Iron sharpeneth iron, the Bible says, and I've had the privilege to share some conversations, and your pastor has insight, and such a blessing as well to be with his family and to see them in the work of God. Last night, or was it last night? I think it was last night, I, uh, I said, you know, I've enjoyed so much about this weekend, but one thing I've really enjoyed, you've taken me to real restaurants. <laughs> Organic, healthy, no big steak, you know, no, we're going to spend $50 on every plate. It's just like, yeah, $15, good, clean, healthy food. So thank you for being real and not having to put on some big show like we do things differently than everybody else in the world. What a privilege to be here. And what a privilege to speak to the leaders of this church. You know, there really aren't teachers until there are learners. And, and this was a group of learners, people that were hungry to learn and to hear about the things of God. So such a blessing to be with you. Thank you for being attentive and listening to all the things and and uh, people even took notes, so thank you. I don't know what you're writing down. Maybe it was a crossword you were working on. But it sure made me feel good, like that somebody wrote something down. So such a good weekend. Well, I'm, 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 I'm different. Huh. That didn't work so well. I thought maybe some of the people that were with us uh, this weekend makes, might say, no, you're not. They might say, thank you, whoever said that. You're unique. I am unique. I, I, I think of things in a way that doesn't always seem like other people do. And uh, I, uh, I am not a camp meeting preacher. You've probably figured that out already by now. Uh, but I believe that God has a word for us tonight. Not only a word, but a mandate and a commission for the people of God. You don't appreciate, or maybe you do, we shall know by the end of this service, how great of obligation and responsibility you have. And so we're going to start, if you would take out your phone, when was the last time you went to church and someone said, take out your phone? See, I told you I was unique. Or if you don't have a phone with you, take out a piece of paper. We are... Uh, we're going to do something a little different here to begin with. And so you need a piece of paper or you need a phone. You need a place to just write down 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And we are going to start this evening by doing a multiple choice test. Doesn't that sound like fun? You thought I was going to get up here and sweat and stomp and spit? Maybe we will. But right now, we're going to do a test. And so, if you've got that all ready to go, you can write the two, the three, the four, the five, the six, as we go. And so, we're going to write and we're going to do a little test. And if you can't see it at the back, I'm going to read this to you. This is a world knowledge test. Here we go. Question number one. In all low-income countries across the world today, how many girls... Finish primary school. A, 20%, B, 40%, or C, 60%. In all low-income countries across the world, what, how many girls finish primary school? 20%, 40%, or 60%? We're going to go quickly, so I hope you've got your answer already. Number two, where does the majority of the world's population live? 
Does it live in low-income countries, middle-income countries, or high-income countries? Number three, in the last 20 years, the proportion of the world population living in extreme poverty has what? A, almost doubled, B, remained more or less the same, or C, almost halved. Hope you've got your answer because we're moving on. Number four. Number four says in all, sorry, it says, what is the life expectancy of the world today? On aggregate, when you add everybody up, what is the life expectancy of the world today? 50 years A, 60 years B, 70 years C. Write down your answer. No bowing out. Everybody, write an answer. Come on, this will be fun. All right. Number five. There are 2 billion children in the world today aged 0 to 15 years old. 2 billion. How many children will there be in the year 2100, aged 0 to 15? In the year 2100, will there be 4 billion children, 3 billion children, or 2 billion children? Today there's 2 billion. Number six. Is everybody writing something down? Raise your hand if you're writing down answers. That's good. Thank you. Number six, worldwide, 30-year-old men have spent 10 years in school on average. How many years have women of the same age completed or spent in school? Nine years, six years, or three years? 30-year-old men, on average, 10 years. Women of the same age, how many years did they spend? Nine, six, or three A, B, or C. All right, number seven, only three more to go, or four, actually. Uh, Number seven, how did the number of deaths per year from natural disasters change over the last hundred years? They've more than doubled, they've remained about the same, or they've decreased to less than half. How did the number of deaths per year from natural disasters over the last hundred years, did they double? Did they remain about the same, or did they decrease by less than half? Number eight, how many of the world's one-year-old children today have been vaccinated against some disease? 20%, 50%, or 80%? Children, one years of age, how many have been vaccinated? 20%, 50%, or 80%? Number nine, in 1996, tigers, giant pandas, Black rhinos were all listed on the endangered list. How many of these three species are more critically endangered today? Two of them, one of them, or none of them? A, B, or C? Everybody still writing down answers? Raise your hand if you're writing down answers. Good. All right, number 10. How many people in the world have some access to electricity? 20%? 50% or 80%? A, B, or C? What percentage of people have access to electricity? 20%, 50%, or 80%? All right. Has everybody got their answers? Are you ready? How did you do? How many people got 70%? Raise your hand if you think you got 70%. Well, no, but, you know, uh, you go to a math test, you know, you could, no? How many people think they only got 50%? Do most people think they failed? <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> All right, here you go. On your mark, get set. C, B, C, 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 A, C, 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 C. Basically, if you didn't choose C for number two or number six, you got them wrong. How many people got five or more right? Raise your hand if you got five or more right. (laughs) IV. Exactly. Sister Shoemaker got more than five right. How many people got three right? 
How many people got none right? <laughs> All right, thank you. Why does this matter? Here we are in church on a Sunday night. And probably for most of us, I would say it was probably less than 5 or 10% of people have passed this test. And why does it feel like you knew the answers? Why does it feel like, why, why, well, tell me, why do you feel or how do you feel right now? Maybe you feel unlearned. Maybe you feel like, what's, how come I didn't know the answers to this? How come isn't, I thought, I thought everybody would at least get 50%, you might have said to yourself. On average, uh, the Nordic countries do best in the world on this test. The rest of the world, on average, gets about 20 to 30% of the answers correct. And it begs the question, why? And the answer is this. Because we have been fed a story by the media and by the newspapers that everything is getting worse. Now, stay with me for a second because we're going to come back to this idea of, well, is it getting worse or is it getting better? But across all of these social indicators, life expectancy, child mortality, education, wealth, or poverty uh, avoidance. Across all of these indicators around the world, the world is actually getting better. And yet we don't understand or believe that to be true sort of intuitively. And it begs the question why that is a group of three, four, five hundred people that are educated people can't get a test like this right. And I don't know how it makes you feel, but I can tell you how it made me feel. It made me feel like somebody's been lying to me. It made me feel like, how is it that I wouldn't know some very simple statistics? What if the world is getting better? What does that do to your faith? What does it do to your faith if all of a sudden people are living longer? People are acquiring more income. Child mortality is going down. Um, Poverty is being abolished. Um, Countries are, are rising out of natural disasters and having better life. What does that do to your faith? Have you built your faith around this idea that somehow the world is getting worse, therefore I go out on Saturday morning to reach the loss because my knock-knock goes something like this. Are you concerned about the way the world is going? Are you afraid of all the things you're reading in the news? Are you concerned about climate change? Are you concerned about increases in violence and crime and all of the other things that we read in our newspapers? And we knock doors with this idea that somehow the world is getting worse and therefore we're trying to reach the world. Let me be very clear to you. I'm not living for God because the world is either up or down. My commitment to God has nothing to do with my income level. It has nothing to do with my life expectancy. It has nothing to do with whether I get a disease, whether there's natural disasters or there's not natural disasters. This is a really, really important concept. Because if you're going to go into the marketplace with a word of hope and truth for this world, it's not a hope of, hey, come live for God because isn't the world a terrible place? Now, put a pin in that for a second because we're going to come back to that. But I'm not going to work every day and saying, don't you want to live for God because the world's a terrible place? No, I go to work and I tell people, don't you want to live for God? For a God that's a loving God? 
that, that changes your mind. The Bible says if any person is in Christ, they're a new creature. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. I'm serving God because he's a loving God. He's a forgiving God because I can have a relationship with the creator of the heavens and the earth. I can come boldly before the throne of grace. I can feel the presence of God. I can feel him wrap his spirit around me. That's why I'm living for God. I'm tired of all these atheists that said, well, if there was really a God, why are all these bad things happening in the world? Well, natural disasters are down by half. Is there a God now? Well, is there a God now? You've made an argument for your entire life that there isn't a God because if there was a God and he is good, then all these bad things aren't happening. Well, good things are happening. Is there a God now? Are you still living in selfishness? Are you still thinking of only yourself? Or can you submit yourself to a loving God? This is so, so very important. Let me go back to the pin. Because there's another statistic that we don't talk about. Did you know that the life expectancy, now it's, it's infinitesimal, but nevertheless, did you know that the life expectancy in 2015, 2016, sorry, 2017, 2018, that the life expectancy in the United States has gone down. How is that possible in a country that spends more per capita on health care than any country in the world? How is it possible that the last time, by the way, there was a three-year trend of life expectancy decrease in the United States was 1915 to 1918? little Spanish flu thing that was going on and 600,000 people lost their life. Oh, there was this World War I thing going on. Not since that time has the life expectancy in the United States gone down. Why has the life expectancy of the United States gone down? They call it the disease of despair. CDC, you can Google it if you're inclined. Opioid... Overdose and an increase in suicide. How does this make sense to anyone? That in a country like the United States or Canada or the UK, that life expectancy would go down because of these diseases of despair, because of depression and anxiety that is driving people to suicide and to addictions and ultimately to overdoses. All of this matters. You're here on a Sunday night and going, why, why, what does this matter? It matters because it is incumbent upon us to be more bold than we have ever been in our time serving God. Whether you've been a Christian for five years or 30 years, this is the time for boldness, unlike any other time before. That more than any time, we have got to stand up in the marketplace and raise our voices because we have a truth that they don't have. The experiment of secularism has failed. It's not like we're we're trying. We're sh- look, the the experiment has failed. Well, just give us one more chance. No, you've had a hundred years, or fifty years, or whatever period of time you want. You could talk from the Enlightenment forward. You can talk from the sixties forward. I, I don't care what date you use. But the reality is, is the experiment has failed. I'm so tired of hearing, yeah, but Christianity is so, so evil. Look at all the people that have been killed throughout all the years because of Christianity. Brother, I I, I don't like to cold call and you don't have to answer. It's a rhetorical question. But can you tell me how many people have died at the hands of Christianity? Inquisitions, crusades, you can use whatever you want. 
And then could you tell me how many people have died in the last hundred years because of secular ideology? Popot, Idi Amin, Stalin, Lenin, Mao, Hitler. Over 200 million people have died at the hands of despots in the last hundred years because of secular ideology and communist ideology. And this is not about politics of communism. This is about an ideology that is anti-God. It is an ideology of secularism. It is an ideology that in us, in our humanity, that in mankind, somehow if we work just a little bit harder, if we think about it just a little bit longer, if we join together just a little bit more, somehow we're going to come up with the answers. But we don't have the answers, people. We have a hundred years of history of failure, of, of killing, murdering people because of secular ideology. And it's time that as Christians, we stand up in the marketplace and stand up at our places of work and we say, hey, no, let me challenge that thought. What do you mean Christianity's done things? How many people have died in the Inquisition? How many people died at the Crusades? It's about three to five million. And by the way, the Crusades were not good. The Inquisition was not good, but we're not talking 200 million people. And any Christian worth their salt would detest those events. The experiment has failed. And the question is, are you bold enough to raise your voice? Elder Shoemake spoke to us on Saturday about the need to get into our community and to reach our communities because they're lost. You work, if you have a job, you work with somebody who has been sexually abused. If you have a job, there is a high probability you work with somebody whose child is on drugs. If you work, there's a high probability that you work with somebody who has either had committed suicide in their family or they know a friend that has committed suicide. The amount of, 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 of distress and despair that is happening in the lives of our communities and we sit sometimes silent because we're afraid to get into the debate because they have so much knowledge behind them and they quote all their statistics and they talk about what the media reported on and didn't you read this story and didn't you read this story but the reality is it's lies. The experiment has failed. Are you bold enough to say it? Are you bold enough? And and to our guests tonight, thank you for being here. You know the experiments failed. You've tried this. You've tried that. You've tried the seminars. You've tried maybe medications. You've tried illicit medications. You've tried entertainment. You've tried all the vices and things that will distract your brain. And you keep coming back to the same anger and the same bitterness and the same despair and the same disappointment. And you cry yourself to sleep and you wake up in anxiety and depression and you know that the experiments failed and you don't know where to turn. People again, they say, yeah, but the, you know, the Bible, it's just, it's got so many rules. I say, you're right. It has a lot of rules, doesn't it? Man, there's a lot of rules in the Bible. Uh, just out of curiosity though, which, which one don't you like? Is it, is it the adultery one? Is that the one that kind of gets you down? Is that the one that's a little tough for you? Maybe it's the stealing one. You don't like the stealing. Maybe you don't like the idea of loving your neighbor as yourself. You think hate's a good solution to, to the problems of the world. Right? You go down the list, and they're left going, well, uh, I, I mean, look, I, I just don't know. <laughs> You know, I, I, didn't, I don't know all the rules in the Bible, but I know there's a lot. Well, not really. Let me tell you what they are. And you tell me which one you disagree with. 
We have such a hope. I, I don't know if this is a, a Canadian expression, uh, but we've got to get off our back foot and get on our front foot, right? When you strike, boom, right? You move, you move forward, you front foot, right? We're not back here. We're not backing up. Get on our front foot. We've got truth. We've got hope. We've got knowledge. <laughs> evolution. Let's talk about evolution for a second. Well, I just don't believe that there's a God. I believe that we went from, you know, from this primordial mud into these complex beings that we are today. And, and somehow, you know, through the process of time and chance and, you know, natural selection and survival of the fittest and all that, you know, boom, out pops this amazing, miraculous thing called life. And so I play along with it for a while and I say, well, let's, let's assume that, that we did evolve. Let's just play that out to its logical conclusion. Let's just talk about what it would mean if, in fact, there is no purpose or no design to my life. Let's just play out this idea that, that I'm a cosmic accident, that somehow some things got together in the soup and that ultimately created some level of single molecule that turned into this single type thing that became more complex and ultimately I come out. But at the end of the day, it was happenstance. At the end of the day, it was just this process we call evolution. And I say, well, let's believe that for just a second. And let me ask you this. Do you like courage? What do you think about love? Do you think sacrifice is real? Do you think love is real? How would you feel about me taking your child and dropping it off a building? Why do you love a human being? Why is courage so, so amazing when we see it demonstrated? You see, if we're cosmic accidents, if we're nothing but biochemical firings of, of synapses in our brain, if there's no design or no purpose to our life, then love doesn't exist. Love is baking soda and vinegar. You put it in a jar and it goes fizzy, 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 and then it stops fizzling. Look, if we're just biochemical responses to things that happen in our brain, then we're nothing more than vinegar and baking soda. There is no courage. If we're accident, then there's no culpability. I say to the evolution, I say, you know what, you're right, that we are accident. There is no design. It, it all happened by this cosmic accident. So why do we put people in prison? How can it be somebody's fault for doing something if they're not in control of themselves? How can there be culpability? My brain told me to do it. And why is that wrong? See, the arguments break down everywhere you look. But the question is, the question is, are we courageous enough? Are we bold enough to get into the arena? Are we bold enough to get into the arena and reach our community? Why is it that we're intimidated? Why we're intimidated because of things like this? Because we've been fed a bunch of lies that, that this is happening, that's happening, and nobody this, and nobody likes that, and everybody's against Christianity. But when you talk to people, what you recognize is they're lost. They're helpless. And they've run out of good ideas. They don't know what to do. And we have the answer. The Bible says we are the salt of the earth. This is a fabulous, and I don't have time to teach a lesson on the salt of the earth, but did you know that when Jesus looked at his disciples and said, you are the salt of the earth, let's skip that one and go to the next one, that when he looked at his disciples and said, you are the salt of the earth, what he was saying is that everything in life is converging around you. Read about the history of salt. Everything that happened during that time, 
All of the great human inventions were as a result of getting salt. The first roads in Rome were as a result of getting to the salt mines, which is why they called them the salaria. A man in love in, in Latin is a salix. Why? Because he's in a salted state. The wars, the trade routes, the roads that they made, the inventions that they created in the time when Jesus said that to them, all of that intersected around salt. And when he looked at them that day, and there's an entire 30 minutes I could spend on the history of salt, but when he looked at his disciples that day, what he said to them is, everything in life intersects around you. Walk into every arena. Walk into the economic arena and stand up and say, money is not the most important thing in the world. Harvard Business Review had an article. They were talking about money. They said, it's amazing how people will do incredibly stupid things in pursuit of money. Harvard Business Review. We can intersect the economic world. They used to salt babies before their baptism. They throw salt on the stage before the performers to ward off the spirits. And and what Jesus is saying is we intersect even even the religions of the world. We intersect the faith of people. We intersect the superstition of people. Every facet of their life, whether they're working, whether they're playing, whether they're being entertained, whatever they do, whether they're loving, every single aspect of their life requires the intersection of Christians. We've got to intersect our life with hope and with truth. We have the hope. We have the hope. On March 11, 2011, some of you might remember this event. This was the Japanese tsunami. 16,000 lives were lost. $360 $360 billion of property was lost and damaged. And it was a terrible, terrible fate for the com- country of Japan. But what's most disappointing, what's most discouraging about this was not the fact that it happened and the 16,000 lives and the billions of dollars that was lost. But what's most disappointing about this was it didn't have to happen. You have a solution for creating tsunamis. You, you, You know something the scientists don't know about stopping tsunamis. I do, and so did they. They're called tsunami stones. This is a tsunami stone in a village, Aniyoshi, Japan, that had, I don't know, 60, 70 inhabitants, I'm not sure. But what those 60 or 70 inhabitants of Aniyoshi knew is they knew that they had a tsunami stone. And if you go to the island of Japan, you'll find that There are hundreds, thousands of tsunami stones. And the question is, what do these tsunami stones say? They say, don't build below this level. It wasn't the first tsunami. How will we feel? We are God's tsunami stones. We've been placed divinely. I have this really great job at XYZ Company. Boy, God sure did good to me. No, you are divinely placed there. Not because you're going to get RSUs, for those of you who are in tech, or options. You're divinely placed there because you have the ability to parse not only the technological capability and the intellectual capability, but you're capable of taking that and parsing that and bringing that forward with a Christian context. 
You are the tsunami stone of your community. And, and I want to be careful when I say this because I, I, I understand the weight in which I'm saying this and, 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 I, and I'm not asking you to bear the entire weight. And in, case, in some cases, I'm not even asking you to bear any of the weight. But I'm asking you merely to consider the fact that the people that are in your sphere of influence, that as their life begins to disconnect, not that you feel the the responsibility, not that you assume culpability for that, but there has to be something in us that says, did I do enough? Did I say enough? Did I reach enough into the conversation? When I heard about them doing this and their child going here or that, did I offer just a simple, may I pray for you? Did you have enough courage to walk into that conversation? And, and they may be they may be liberal and they may have all the stats and all the figures and all of this, but they know we're better than anybody that the things that they are holding on to are not providing in the answers that they need. They're hanging by a thread. God, help us. Help us, help us, help us, help us to reach our world. It is so, so necessary that we reach the world and those in our care that God has given to us. January 27th, 1986, I remember and you, if you were old enough, no doubt remember exactly where you were the fateful day the shuttle exploded. And there's been a lot written about this tragic event. And some of what's been written is, was there negligence on the part of the engineers and the people that launched that day? If you listen or read the story or do some research on it, you'll find that the day that they were going to launch was at least 20 degrees colder than they had ever launched before. They had launched it higher temperatures, and the lowest temperature in the 24 launches previous, they had never gone below 53 degrees. And so there was some question about how the shuttle would perform. Now, for those of you who are old enough, you know that the the ultimate thing was the O-rings that failed. And they knew that there might be a problem with the O-rings, And on the evening before, 34, 37 approximately, engineers, the manufacturers, the people from NASA all got together and had a very vociferous debate around what's going to happen. And they pulled all the data and they looked at all the facts and all the figures and, and tried to determine would it be safe to launch, should they or shouldn't they. And as we know, ultimately, they chose to launch that day. Jim Collins, in his book, How the Mighty Have Fallen, says what happened that fateful day was not negligence or dereliction of duty on the part of the engineers. It was what he called an inversion of the question. The question they asked themselves was the wrong question. Because what they asked on that day is, could you prove that it is safe to launch? And what they should have said is, can you prove that it's not safe? Because nobody could prove it was safe because they had never launched at 33 degrees. And because the question was inverted, because the question was wrong, they launched. Let's stand tonight. The question tonight is not do they need to hear. 
we could all in in a hundred percent agreement. Do they need to hear truth? Do they need to hear the hope? Do they need to hear the solution? The Bible says in him are hid all the treasures of, of wisdom and knowledge. John says that he'll give us life and life more abundant. The question tonight is not, do they need to hear? The question tonight is, will they hear from you? The first question doesn't necessitate activity. You could answer it in the affirmative and hope somebody doesn't. Do they need to hear? Absolutely, they need to hear. We're all in agreement? Good, let's go home. God bless, have a great week. But that's not the question. The question is, will they hear from us? God help us to reach our world. I'm tired of us being told what to think. I'm tired that on a test like the one we did, that that generally people get it wrong because we've been told all of these things that they've wanted us to think. And I'm tired of being told what to think. But right doesn't matter. Hear me. Right doesn't matter if you don't tell. Right doesn't matter if you don't tell. God help us. To our guests tonight, you know, like I know, in your honesty, in the quiet, you know that the experiment has failed. You've tested it. You've back-tested it. But tonight is your opportunity to find the solution to what you've been looking for. Whether it's addiction, bitterness from the toll of life, that you can't shake the anger and the betrayal of relationships failed, of relationships of, of disadvantage, And you've read and you've listened and you've spent money. You've read books. But the answer is in Jesus Christ. The hope of life. Truth. Righteousness. A sound mind. Oh, what some people would give just to have quiet in their minds. The Holy Ghost can quiet your mind. The Bible says in Ezekiel, a new heart will I give you. And a new spirit I'll put within you. I'll activate you and I'll animate you in a way that that is, is, is from God above. Paul does such a fabulous job in Romans chapter 7. He says, the things I used to love, now I hate. That, that, that they, had, they had power over me. But when the Spirit of Christ comes, you're made new. And that activating and animating force of addictions in your life are broken by the Spirit of God. Miracles of healing, physical healings, spiritual healings, emotional healings, all of these are available to you if you'll surrender yourself. Say, God, help me. Tired of the lie. 
Is there anyone tonight? For the church family, my question to you is will you recommit? Will you recommit to showing this great hope to the world? Will you enter your spheres of influence with boldness, with courage, to be thoughtful, to be strong of mind? We have truth. So I'm asking tonight that that we fill up the front of this building. Guests, we invite you to come and, and fill it up with us. That if you would come forward tonight and surrender, God, I'm broken. God, I'm weak and I'm fragile. God, I'm hopeless and helpless without you. God, I surrender. And if the church would fill up this altar and recommit, God, I will be the voice to this world. I'll be the salt and I'll intersect every aspect of life fearlessly. God, anoint me. Will you come tonight? God, I want to be Oh, God, I want to reach my world. God, I want to reach my world.